Hello, everyone. My name is Laura Hammond. I'm a professor of development studies at the School of Oriental and African Studies here in London. Uh, and I'm really very delighted to be able to chair this session today on Somalia's elections, navigating discord, standstill, and insecurity with our featured speaker, um, His Excellency Hassan Ali Kaire, who, as you'll know, was uh, until recently the Prime Minister of the Federal Republic of Somalia from 2017 to 2020. Um, we have an audience participating through Zoom and also joining through the Facebook site. So hopefully you can all uh, see us now. Um, just a few uh, housekeeping items before we start. Um, that just to be clear that all attendees right now will be muted during the presentations. Um, His Excellency Hassan uh, will be speaking for about 15 minutes and we'll have plenty of time for discussion afterwards. Um, when, if you get, if you have questions, you can put them into the chat box at any time uh, during the remarks or afterwards. We have um, some of the Chatham House staff will be gathering the, the comments up and um, collecting them, passing them on to me, and I'll get try to get through as many as possible. Please, please, can I ask you if you are called on to, make, to ask your question, uh, please do it very quickly so that we can get through as many questions as possible. We have a very large audience and we want to make sure that we can hear from as many people and we can get as many responses uh, from our speaker as possible. Um, Zoom participants can also, uh, so you can writ, write questions to the question and answer box. You can also use the raised hand function in the box if you prefer to ask your question. Again, please, can you, when, if you're called on, please keep your question very brief. Just a reminder that all um, this whole, the whole session, the remarks and the question and answer will be on the record, uh, which means that those present may use information from the meeting and can identify the speaker and any other participant. I would also like to remind you that, attend, that, that filming and recording the event are not allowed without prior permission from Chatham House. However, you're welcome to tweet the event using the hashtag CHAfrica. Maybe somebody could put that into the chat for everyone. Um, and uh, we hope that this is really, I'm sure that it's going to be a really full and, and a very interesting hour. This is, a, of course, a crucial time in uh, the sort of life of, of Somalia. Uh, we're all looking uh, very anxiously at the political developments that are going on right now. As you may know, there's a, a, an important meeting going on in Dusmarib at the moment. Um, we may hear some of, uh, some of what's coming out of that meeting. Um, but we're looking not just to what happens at the elections, but what, what will happen afterwards. And so we're really very, very lucky today to have His Excellency Hassan Ali Khaire um, to, to share his thoughts and reflections and experience with us. Uh, as I mentioned, he served as Prime Minister of the Federal Republic of Somalia from 2017 to 2020. He's now a presidential candidate in Somalia's 2021 elections. As prime minister, he oversaw sweeping institutional reforms, including within the financial and security sectors. His Excellency Hassan Ali Khaire initiated several flagship projects during his tenure, including introducing biometric registration for Somalia's uniformed forces and electronic payments of salaries. Prior to his appointment, he served as the executive director for Africa at Soma Oil, he also formerly worked for several years at the Norwegian Refugee Council and served in various senior roles, including area manager, country director, and eventually regional director for the Horn of Africa. It's my great pleasure to welcome His Excellency Hassan Ali Khaire. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. How can you hear me? We hear you very well. Thank you. All right. Uh, just in case there is internet uh, challenges, you will bear with us. But good afternoon, thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to join you here today for this important discussion. I'm grateful to Chatham House for regularly providing a platform for open dialogue and exchange on Somalia as part of its focus for this century to enable and build peaceful, sustainable, and inclusive society. Chatham House, throughout the first century of its existence, has been a friend to Africa and the global south given audiences to legendary independence leaders, such as the 1931 address by Mahatma Gandhi, 
where he set out the vision that still drives India today, 90 years on. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank Professor Laura Hammond for her kind introduction and particularly for her continued service and dedication to socialist issues in the Horn of Africa and globally. Excellencies and ladies and gentlemen and colleagues, we meet at a time when the COVID-19 pandemic has cost the world over 2 million lives thus far, disrupted livelihoods, and is leading to the deepest global recession. The crisis has magnified the disparities and inequalities of the world we share. It is currently playing out in a vaccine nationalism where some countries have secured billions of doses of COVID-19 vaccines, while others struggle to access supplies. Where over 108 million doses of the vaccine have been administered, and less than 50,000 of that number is in Africa. Even if there was access, a country like Somalia would not be in a position to financially place an order for purchase and would only depend and the goodwill of the world to donate vaccines. The COVID-19 crisis has also aggravated and magnified economic and social challenges that already exist within nations. In the Horn of Africa, simmering political tensions in Ethiopia has led to armed conflict in the Tigray region, with thousands of refugees crossing the border into Sudan, even as border tensions escalate between Ethiopia and Sudan. These tensions, along with Eritrea's long standing conflict with the TPLF and the Somalia Kenya border challenges, may alter the regional order and endanger stability. Somalia finds itself in the middle of a volatile region with its additional baggage of 30 years of uncertainty and instability. To weather this unprecedented storm, the Somali people must therefore understand the grave importance of sustaining the progress achieved over the past two electoral cycles since the end of our transitional government. For the past decade, despite the shortcomings and challenges in Somalia, there have been indirect electoral processes that were largely viewed as peaceful and acceptable to all political stakeholders leading to a peaceful transfer of power. Unfortunately, this year, the ongoing electoral impasse risks that had an political culture, which is one of the major positive achievements of the past 30 years. Upholding democracy and conducting free, fair, and transparent elections is not a challenge only in Somalia, only in Somalia and while democracy is the most preferred system of governance, we have recently learned that it requires strong and mature institutions to ensure its protection, although it is the citizen's fundamental right. Citizens around the world have the right to elect their preferred leaders. But sometimes the result of seemingly democratic elections can produce undecided leadership that puts to test all democratic values and ideas. Other times, democracy can be hijacked in the absence. Other times, democracy can be hijacked in the absence of a strong institution. The recent U.S. election is the latest example of how well-functioning institutions safeguarded the world's oldest serving democracy. Therefore, if there was ever any doubt of the importance of a strong, viable institution, the aftermath of the US 2020 election is our lesson. Somalia, as a nation, can affirm in the absence of a strong and viable institution, individuals take on that role. And we depend on the goodwill of those individuals to prevent the nation from crisis and conflict. The current electoral impasse, simply put, is a situation where the nation's institutions could not safeguard against attempts to derail the very fabric 
of the social contract that has existed between the Somali people. This has paved the way for great mistrust that goes beyond fear of mismanagement of the electoral process. And although there was initially an agreement by the federal government and the federal member states on September 17, 2020, on the conduct of an indirect election, challenges arose in the arbitrary management on, of the implementation phase. These, these challenges include the unilateral appointment of electoral management committees that included civil servants, security personnel, and no non-supporters of the current leadership. It also included the undue interference in the electoral management of the Somaliland seats. It included the unrest in some of the federal member states, especially in Gedo and in Beledwain, as a result of interference by the FGS with the intention of unduly influencing the electoral process. It also included the real fear of militarized election. History tells us that the development and trajectory of fragile countries such as, such as ours are inevitably linked to the management of electoral processes. An attempt to arbitrarily implement an electoral process without the agreement of the majority of the political stakeholders will result in a dire consequence and might have long-lasting repercussions. The main risk of a disputed electoral process will result in a disputed outcome that will not be legitimate in the eyes of the majority of the stakeholders. That would constitute a great setback in a fragile democracy like Somalia. Such an election would also aggravate our already fragile security situation and further embolden Al Shabaab and other armed groups. The improved political stability over the past 10 years has also resulted in an energized business community. And this will undoubtedly reverse this positive trend, impacting the livelihoods and aspirations of our population. Somalia's revival has also been attributable in part to the generosity of our international partners whose public funds are collected from populations who freely and fairly elect their leaders. In the event of an undemocratic and arbitrary electoral process, it is unlikely that this support will continue at current levels. A volatile electoral process would also dampen the recent active participation by Somalia's youth in our country's reconstruction. Ladies and gentlemen, to further paint this picture, Somalia soon will be in an uncharted territory, the mandate of our federal parliament, the backbone of our democracy, expired on the 27th of December 2020. And in four days, our country faces a critical constitutional crisis where the president's mandate expires on February 8th. Considering both the executive and legislature will have lost the legitimacy to govern, the only solution to avert this looming crisis is therefore an immediate political solution. The focus is now shifted to a consensus-based agreement between all political stakeholders. These will include the federal member states, representatives of the government whose term is expiring, the union of the presidential candidates and non-partisan groups such as civil society, women leaders, business community, youth, religious leaders, and members of the international community. To salvage the legitimacy and integrity of the electoral process, all political stakeholders have to be part of the political solution and agree on the management of the 17th September agreement, as well as address the constitutional crisis brought on by the expiry of the mandate of the governing institutions. This will require selfless leadership from all the stakeholders that puts the nation's interest before personal and political ambition. And while we seek solutions for today's crisis, 
we must also learn from this challenge so as to not repeat the mistake of the past and rebuild the institution that can safeguard against such situation in the future. Having that in mind, while I was in F office, we undertook the biggest and most challenging reforms that our country had undertaken in the past 30 years. The economic reforms that my team and I initiated led to Somalia's attaining decision point for the relief, an unthinkable accomplishment at that time. The critical and sometimes dangerous security reforms that we undertook reinstated, reinstated faith in Somalia's security institutions internally and also build trust with our main security partners. The reforms of our civil service contributed to a greater commitment by the government to ingrain a new war culture in our public services to execute their responsibility. By embracing this new culture of accountability, corruption was no longer, no longer a taboo subject. Public servants were more motivated to execute their mandates and the general public were more committed as engaged citizens willing to do their part in the rebuilding of our nation. The new culture above all inspired many of our Somali youth to take their rightful role as the drivers of transformative agenda and change for our country. Unfortunately, the political challenge of the past six months, the lack of focus of continued reforms and the deep mistrust in government's electoral management halted the progress made thus far. For our country to emerge out of its perpetual situation, the next administration must prioritize the rebuilding of a viable institution and a functioning economy in order to be able to provide services, sustain its activities, and ultimately gain legitimacy in the eyes of the Somali people. This is because without functioning economy, any government will not be able to provide services to its people. And any government that is not able to provide services to its people will not enjoy the popular support of its population. And based on my experience, our country cannot establish strong institutions and promote sufficient economic growth in order to meet our society's needs if we do not undertake critical and comprehensive political reforms that are necessary to attain political security and economic stability. For Somalia to achieve political stability that would aid in institution building, economic growth and service delivery, it is important for the next administration's priority to be the completion of the provisional constitution. This would unblock a number of interconnected priorities that have been pending over the past 12 years, including attaining one person, one vote, improved security, and advanced federal structures. The completion of the constitution would provide the basis for a strong and legit legitimate governance structure and address the deep mistrust that has existed in the country. The next leadership must therefore prioritize inclusive political dialogue to address the contentious and long-standing issues that have always been set aside to conclude the constitution. These include, but are not limited to, finding a solution to the status of Mogadishu, having agreement on fiscal federalism, the electoral and political party system, and an agreed structure of government that can lead to stability. The completion of these and other articles will require both technical and political expertise, but the essence of succeeding is to promote inclusive political reform that includes all stakeholders and making it the number one national agenda. These political objectives will enable the changes we need to encourage social cohesion, improve security, rebuild our economy, attract the investors, and enhance the capacity of government to deliver services. This will lay the foundation of the state that the next administration needs to be put in place for the next four years. 
paving the way for a prosperous Somalia that can make its contribution to the region and global community. This will therefore require leadership that has the capacity to bring people together, capitalize on its youthful population, empower our women and build the institutions that can protect the well-being of all Somalia. It will require leadership that understands how to deal with contemporary challenges, take a major role in bridging the divide between Somalia and the region, and can understand that in a globalized world, Somalia can chart, cannot chart its path in isolation. It will require leadership that can promote and agree on the agenda of the new Somalia with all political stakeholders and our partners. I am hopeful that if we come together, we Somalis can achieve this. I thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Um, you've, you've set us up very well for, I think, uh, what will be a very interesting um, conversation. Um, you've, you've really touched on the importance, clearly, of inclusive politics, of, inclus of a clus inclusive political process, as well as a, an inclusive political state, a government, um, and, and touched on both some of the challenges that have been that you've faced in the past in your own public service, but as well those that your administration, should it be successful, would, would um, tackle uh, going forward into the future. Um, we've got a few, we've got several questions here, and um, I'm, we'll try to get through as many of them as we can. If I can, again, um, if I can again remind people to keep their questions quite short, um, I'm going to uh, ask uh, Abdullahi Osman, are you there? Could you ask your question? You can unmute yourself and then ask it. Are you there, Abdullahi Osman? If I don't hear from someone quickly, I might just ask their question so we can keep moving. Okay. You're there, go ahead. Yes, hi, uh, good morning. Uh, uh, good morning, uh, I want to thank Ch Chatham House and I want to thank His Excellency for his uh, uh, presentation. My, my question is, uh, uh, His Excellency was the Prime Minister of Somalia for about three and a half years of this regime. Uh, the same regime, the same things happened for the past, I mean, for the, 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 the last regime that we have waited until the last uh, uh, half a year or so to start to talk about elections and, and, and the modalities of the elections. To me, the question that I do have how much of this failure uh, of, of this regime, and for, of course the, the regime before that, is, the, is the, His Excellency willing to say I was part of it? And, 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 and specifically what I'm talking about, the, the, the completion of the uh, unfinished constitution since 2012, the building of the constitutional court, I'm talking about the, the, the legal framework as well as the, the, uh, the uh, what do you call, the institutional frameworks to, to accomplish this. I thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, can I can I ask a couple of have a couple of questions? If, is that all right, Your Excellency? And then if we okay. give you a couple of questions, and then you can respond yes, to them as a in a two or three, yeah. Yes, please. Lord. Perfect. Okay, uh, Mohammed Haji, are you there? Mohammed Haji, you have a question around um, reforming Somali civil service. Hello. Maybe he's having difficulty muting, unmuting. I'll ask his question for him. Um, he says, as presidential candidate, how do you plan to reform the Somali civil service? There is a repeated lack of institutional capacity in the civil service while corruption persists due to clanism and nepotism in making appointments. So that is his question. And if you can, can you, if you can take a note of that, I will take the liberty of adding one more question from Fataye Gele. Are you there? Fateh, are you there? Hello. Hello. Hi. 
I am so sorry. Thank you so much, Professor Hammond, um, Excellency Faria, for a great presentation. Um, my question really was about the Constitutional Court, um, with the upcoming elections, all the wranglings, and uh, obviously the consequences of that, of not having a Constitutional Court for the federal, uh, federal government of Somalia to settle the disputes. Um, if, if the uh, Excellency Khairia can actually elaborate on that, would be very helpful. Thank okay, you. Perfect. Thank you so much. Right. Okay. I'll, I'll, uh, Your Excellency, let, let me give you the floor now to respond to those questions and we'll do another round after. Go ahead. I understand it was Abdullahi who had the first question on one person, uh, one vote uh, question. Um, I'm, I'm grateful to his question. Uh, and I want to clear one thing out for our colleagues who are listening to me and fellow Somalis out there. In order for us to have a one person, one vote, there are steps we need to take. Uh, and these steps include, uh, we need to know what kind of government structure we would want, what kind of government system we would want. Would want what kind of political party agreements we would want as a country. We also need to accept that uh, in order for that to happen, there must be political agreement between the federal government, federal member states and all political stakeholders. There has always been a debate uh, for the past 12 years on a one person, one vote election. And I think that would give the best governance in our country. But the real reality is that we must ensure that we have a constitution that answers the critical questions that we spoke about. And in my address, uh, there are things I spoke about in terms of the outstanding article that we need to have political agreement. Concluding the constitution, it is not what is difficult. What is difficult is to have a political agreement among all political stakeholders. And that's why I said, in the next administration is priority, uh, concluding the constitution to enable us one person, one vote, must be the priority. And I agree that uh, that was a, a, an agenda that has been there since 2012, was you silent for it. Uh, the second question, of Muhammad Haji in terms of a uh, civil service uh, and uh, institutions. Uh, I said it in my opening remark that in the absence of functioning and a strong institutions, um, individuals tend to take their position. The nation depends therefore the goodwill of those people and how they conduct themselves. So when you don't have an institution that function, and the individuals that serve the nation are not able to uh, put in place an institution that can run the govern government, then we'll have a problem. That's why during my uh, tenure as a prime minister, uh, my whole focus was to build functioning institutions. And I agree with you, the best way forward to prevent corruption and to promote a governance that is as inclusive as possible we must have institutions that uh, we all need uh, and feel that uh, they serve uh, in a fair and transparent and just manner. Uh, on the final question, Professor, in terms of the Constitutional Court, this again comes back uh, in the Constitution uh, reform that we've talked about. Uh, in order for us to have a Constitutional Court, the federal government and the federal member states must first agree on what kind of justice model the country should have. If we don't agree on that and have it in the constitution, then we won't be able to put in place a constitutional court that is agreed by all parties. That is why, as we did security sector reform, civil service reform, economic reform, the next major agenda of our country is a comprehensive and incl inclusive political reform that I think would answer all the questions uh, these three uh, great colleagues of us did ask me. Uh, thank you, Professor. 
Thank you so much. Thank you very much. All right, I'm going to now turn to some of the hands that are raised. I think the first hand that was raised was um, Abdukarim Mohammed. Are you there? Hello, Abdukarim. You can unmute yourself, I think. Yes. Thank you. Uh, go ahead. Thank you. Do you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Ask your question, please. Uh, His Excellency, I would like to ask uh, uh, every Somali government or every regime fails to build the judicial institutions and to complete the Somali constitution. And instead, they focus on the effects while avoiding causes behind it. For instance, where there's no justice, these cannot prevail. After um, also completing and enforcing the constitution, will crack down the corrupt politicians. So the basic foundation of every government lies on the rule and regulation that governs the principle of government system and to have system that's above everyone. So I conclude my question, uh, why not prioritizing on the route which is the fundamental of government, like building the judicial institutions and completing the uh, constitution instead of uh, thinking about other things, why not prioritizing uh, the basic function is of a governance. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, and then uh, I'll ask, get a few questions in here, please. Um, Mr. Guled, Abdi. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Hello, Mr. Guled, Abdi. No? Okay, I'll, maybe we can come back to you afterwards. Uh, Ahmed Abdallah, are you there? Hello, Ahmed Abdallah. Hello? Hello? Yes. Oh, go late. You're there. Okay, yes. go ahead. Yeah, thank That's you, Laura. Briefly. Uh, His Excellency Hassan Ali. You have, since you have been the longest serving prime minister in modern Somalia, you have been so illusional about Somaliland in terms of election. You know Somaliland is, uh, they have been doing, you have been, you have been set up, you know, Somaliland elections will take place in Mogadishu. While it's, you were so reluctant in your terms, to engage Somaliland or to resume their dialogues. Why it happened like this? Why does that happen? Okay, thank you. We have your question about Somaliland. Um, uh, so that's our second question. And then um, Ahmed Abdullah, are you there now? I think you can un unmute yourself now. Ahmed. Hello there, can you hear me? Yes, very well, go ahead. Hello everybody, and um, His Excellency, Mr. Hoyre. I know him very well, and he's a very hardworking guy, and uh, he's a good guy, really, uh, trust me. Okay, can you give us uh, your question? I'm really, and my question is, um, you know, Somalia, we had a plenty of uh, problems, for example, Al Shabaab, and we had uh, leaders who just fighting over the power, and uh, Khaira became one of them. How could we trust him? We know him; he's a candidate now. And over the years, last couple of years, he was trying and telling and promoting uh, us he's going to do one man, one vote, and. Lately, he changed his mind and become the opposition's uh, uh, parties, uh, you know, one of them. And um, I really thinking, how can we trust him now? As we know him, he's a candidate now and he's using um, all the, you know, information uh, he knows. And, you know, that's, that's the main, main question. 
Okay, thank you very much. So I guess in a nutshell, uh, what, 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 what is it about your candidacy that we should trust particularly yeah. now? Um, uh, Hassan, do you want to take those three? Yes, uh, Laura, thank you very much. Uh, Abdikrim, uh, thank you very much for the, for the question. Uh, and I uh, really agree with you the way you put it. Uh, let me give you a, a, an example out of my experience. Uh, for two and a half years, uh, the main, uh, I would say, project we've been working on was how to grow the economy. And to do that, we were eagerly trying to re-engage with the international financial institutions. And we, in Somalia, we've become the fastest nation for the past 30 or 40 years to reach uh, debt relief in a record time. Uh, but in order for us uh, to take advantage of the re-engagement and the access we have to the international uh, financial institutions, including World Bank, IMF, MIGA, IFC, and all this, uh, that required for us um, to answer a number of other questions. And these questions, uh, they go back into the heart of your question. Uh, and that is, in order for our country to attract the investors, the question that will be asked is that, is your country politically stable for investors to come and invest? Is your country security-wise stable for um, investors to come and invest? And do you have a justice and legal system that can promote trust uh, and those investors uh, will have confidence in? All these questions can only be answered if we go back to the political reform questions that you are. And the justice uh, and rule of law is part of the political reform. And now our country has reached as a critical crossroad, which is if we don't answer these questions, we will not be able to build a nation uh, that can compete with our neighbors and take part of the global development. So I fully agree with you, and it should be a priority. Now we have seen it as an example. Um, the question of Gule, um, I take the issue of Somaliland seriously, uh, and it is a very important question. While I was prime minister, we have initiated a dialogue, and uh, we've managed to bring uh, Somalia and our colleagues from Somaliland to come to Djibouti, to Djibouti where the, most of the international community and neighboring countries uh, were on board on that dialogue. Unfortunately, we've just reached a, 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 a degree of progress, but we haven't concluded a, the entire dialogue. Uh, I understand the criticality of it, and I believe that it should be one of the most important priorities the next administration to undertake. Uh, we owe to the Somali people, we owe to the Somaliland people to make sure that this dialogue continues. We also live in a globalized world and uh, we are dependent on one another as brothers and sisters. Uh, I thank my brother Ahmed Abdullah's question and the way he put it. Uh, he doesn't need to trust me, but he needs to trust my record. Yes, I was the longest serving prime minister. In my tenure as a prime minister, um, we have undertaken the most advanced um, economic reform that for the first time lended us credibility within the international financial institutions and our international partners. For the first time, Somali people start to enjoy it for the world to see us differently and receive direct financial support to the government. Uh, for the first time, all the months I was, I was put in place system that enabled every person who worked for the government to work for it in time. We've reformed the security sector reform that everyone thought when I initiated that it was gonna be the biggest disaster. We reformed the civil service reform. Uh, we've changed the culture of work and ethics uh, in the country. We've made the prime minister the best functioning of office our country has known over the past 30 years. With that record, um, if 
the Somali people entrust me uh, with the role of presidency, uh, I can get the job done. Uh, over to you, Professor. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, I have a few questions that have, I'm going back and forth between submitted questions and, and raised hands. So if you've got your hand raised, uh, bear with me. I'll try to get back to some more of those in a few minutes. Um, but we have a question here from Yusuf Omar. Are you there? About Dusamara. Yeah. Yusuf, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Laura, and thank you, Prime Minister. My question is about the, the current meeting in Dusamara. That's about uh, the election in Somalia. We know the Prime Minister, the, the, the federal government of Somalia actually did agree to dissolve the, the, the election committee. And also they, they agreed to refer to the issue of Somaliland to the, to the Speaker of, uh, of the Upper House, uh, Abdi Hashi, and also the Deputy Prime Minister. And also the issue of Gada has been uh, agreed to some extent. So it's all positive. So how do you, uh, what's your reflection as a Prime Minister, uh, the, the success of these agree agreements today in Dosamarred? Thank you. Okay, great. And um, then we also have a question from Abdul Latif. Abdul Lahi? Why are you there? Yeah. Go ahead. Hello? Abdul Latif, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Go for it. Please answer, ask your question. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Chatham House. Uh, thank you, His Excellency Hassan Ali Kaira, uh, our former Prime Minister. I'm Abdul Latif, joining you from Nairobi. My question to His Excellency is, what are your priorities toward this foreign affairs? And will you be able to correct political faults committed by the government or federal government during your tenure, like a spoiling relationship with very important governments like Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, United, United Arab Emirates, and Egypt. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And I'm going to also ask uh, Peter de Klerk, are you there? Can you, you've got your hand raised. Can you ask your question? Peter. Okay, I'll, uh, can you hear me now? Yep, perfect. Okay, um, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, Peter de Klerk, visiting professor uh, in uh, Johannesburg. Um, as you know, the political contract between a state and its people is based on convincing the people that there's an added value to the state in the first place. Now, in spite of your own impressive accomplishments on economic governance and accountable institutions strengthening, do you believe in view of the continued political fragmentation, which is still very clan dominated, that there is enough common ground and collective vision to move forward and keep the nation together to avoid a return to the fractious past where conflicts were resolved by physical confrontation rather than political dialogue. And I'm asking this question in particular in view of the lack of federal stability. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, Your Excellency, are you, are you, can you take those three questions? So we have yes, please, please. Yeah. Uh, thank one about you very the much. Uh, process. Yeah, another about the influence of, of uh, Gulf countries in particular, and then and Peter's last question around national unity. Um, first, I want to thank Yusuf uh, for sharing with us the information he did share with us. Um, we don't have any uh, official reports, uh, at least I don't as of now. Uh, but we are encouraging uh, all of us that those colleagues of us, either from the federal government or federal member states, who are representing the Somali people in the Somalia, that the entire Somali people and the nation are looking at you. And failing to reach an agreement uh, will dash the hopes and the aspirations of the Somali people. So there are three major outstanding elements, as Yusuf put it. And that is the issue of Somaliland, the issue of ghetto, and the issue of electoral management. Uh, and uh, an overall agreement on how to manage the implementation uh, of the content of the agreement. And if the standards are to be positive, I think it is a, a progress for the nation. 
and a, a positive, uh, I would say, step, step for all of us. So we would welcome and we will encourage and we will support should there be a comprehensive ag agreement that the Somali people uh, can be confident of. Uh, the best way forward is for us to have an agreement and to conduct an election uh, so that we can keep that momentum of nation building. On the issue of um, Abdel Latif Abdullahi, um, I want to remind all our colleagues uh, in my country and abroad that we can only be strong internationally when we are strong at home. What we need to focus now first in the next administration is to unify our country, bring the Somali people together and ensure that uh, in a unified uh, and collective um, communities and a nation, uh, we can reach out to the rest of the world and look after our, our interests as we engage with every country. Uh, it is my belief that uh, cooperation works best. And it's my understanding that as we protect the interests of the Somali people, we should have a positive relationship with every country that we can. But these relationships should be based on a mutual interest uh, and mutual trust, mutual respect of all these countries who will have a relationship with. Uh, I thank you, Peter, uh, for serving our country for many years. Uh, and I see his question, which is rooted his deep understanding of the context of Somalia. But I think, Peter, there is a, a political understanding here, which I think you uh, have debated many times with me and other people. But remember that, uh, in our country, um, economic challenges and poverty uh, is the essence of the conflict that we have as a nation. A government that is not able to provide services to its people, a government that cannot uh, build roads, bridges, hospitals, provide education and health services to its people will not have relevance in the eyes of its people. But the problem is, in order for us to provide these services, we must have political stability. And that is why the social contract is absolutely critical. To deal with the security situation, you must to reduce the unemployment. Uh, you must to promote rule of law and governance. You must have functioning in institutions and justice system that work. All these things impact positively in making peaceful nation. That's why all these elements are interlinked. Uh, with a new leadership who understands Mogadishu is not his or her duty station, that reaches out to people, stays with them, feels their pain and prospects, and bring the Somali people together to conclude the constitution, to put a system is in place where people um, can trust, plus a leader who is able uh, to communicate the new Somalia to the rest of the world, uh, I think is doable. Remember, 30 years is a long time, but the Somali people have learned a lot. Now we are at a critical crossroad. And this time, because of the progress we've made while our in office, in terms of the function of an appointed leader, I think I see a potential for our country because now uh, we understand the challenges we face and we have an idea on the solutions on how to translate these challenges into opportunity. But ultimately, it will require a solution that comes within from the Somali people, Peter, and I think it's doable uh, to prevent it from the, the deepening crisis you talk about. Uh, thank you, Professor. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to take the next round of raised hands. I'll, I'll mention the three people so you can be ready to speak uh, one after the other. So we have 
few minutes left. It will, will, uh, I'll take the chair's prerogative and I've had Chatham House's permission to um, go over a little bit if necessary. I hope that's all right, Your Excellency, if you've got a few extra minutes. Um, but uh, the next three would be Adam Matan, Fordoso Loyan, and Mukhtar Mohamud. So Adam, are you there? I am, Laura. Can you, can you hear me? You very well, thank you, go ahead. Perfect. Um, thank you, Laura and Chatham House, and thank you, um, His Excellency and Hassan Ali Khaira for your informative remarks. Um, I wanted to, you talked about inclusive politics, and I wanted to know your thoughts on the allocated 13 seats in, in Mogadishu, and some of the Council of the Presidential Candidates has, has indicated that they oppose the idea, or they see um, the idea as a political maneuvering by the, by the current president. So what are your thoughts on that particular issue? And do you think Mogadishu deserves to get its um, political representation? Thank you. Of course, I have to unmute myself as well. Fardusa, are you there? Okay, go ahead. Fadosa, are you there? Hello, Fadosa. Fadosa Loyan. No? Okay, I'll come back to you. Um, Mukhtar Mahmoud, are you there? Thank, thanks, Laura. I am. Thank you very much. Thank you. Afternoon, Laura and Mr. Hassan Ali Khaira. Uh, just wanted to touch on your your period uh, as the Prime Minister of Somalia. Me, personally speaking, Mukhtar, I, I am literally a product of the war. My family left Somalia, specifically Mogadishu, to move to London after the war kicked off. So I've never lived in the country. Seeing what happened in 2017 with, Mr. with the president Farmaja coming in as a very popular president, arguably probably the most popular with that literal votes taking place, you had a great opportunity with Mr. President Farmaja to make changes. Uh, just to touch on some of the points that you said about the reforms that you made, Mr. Khaire, uh, you mentioned that you made extreme reform or good, very good reforms to security and economics. Just to counter what you said, Mr. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, you, as for the security reforms, you said that you made huge reforms and, and clearly that hasn't mirrored with the security situation on the ground. We saw what happened in 2017 with, with, with attacks in Zorbe, ex-control and many other places within the country. Another issue, Mr. Khaira, that you've mentioned was these economical reforms. What we know factually, referencing the world banks and all other economical hubs that we that are known is that our the somali gdp has continuously decreased so 2017 somali grew by 1.42 18 2.8 19 2.9 and we'll leave 2020 because i wouldn't think that would be fair let me move to, let me move to my question now with that level of popular support that you and mr farmaja had and, and uh, why did you not use that to catapult and make actual changes, Mr. Hassan Khairi? And what was the main driving factor that stopped you from gaining and using that momentum? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And um, I think I'll, I'll also bring in uh, Sadia Ali. Are you there? Sadia? Yeah, hello, Ms. His Excellency, uh, and, and hi, uh, Laura. Um, I, I would like to ask you a question because uh, the women, women's role and women's role in elections and vote. Um, uh, luckily, there's a 30%, but the 30% is only nominal. And at the moment, the women and how they are selected, is, uh, including the men, it's not based on their capacity and qualification for the job. So many people like ourselves are kept uh, uh, at the gates because of it is clan based. So uh, my question to you is that men have failed miserably. That is setting aside, setting aside the progress that you mentioned, still our country is in a turmoil after 30 years. Do you think it's about time that men stood aside 
and women take over the role. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Your Excellency, would you like to take those three questions, please? Yes, uh, on the issue of um, uh, the first question of uh, the 13 cities of Mogadishu, um, I, I thank my brother for asking me that. And as you could reference from my uh, speech, uh, the first item I've mentioned that is outstanding of the constitution is the status of Mogadishu. Mogadishu, as you put it, has the right uh, of representation. Uh, and it is known to everyone, it is a city with over 3 million uh, people. But the real reality is that uh, the constitution says we need to determine the status of Mogadishu first, and it has to be agreed. Uh, in order for this to materialize, we need to accept the reality that it must, must to be included in uh, the revision of the constitution, and it must to be agreed by all the political parties. Uh, and that is why it is absolutely urgent that we need to undertake the political reforms that I've said we should initiate. I, uh, I am thankful to Mukhtar on his question. I understand that he hasn't been to his country. I look forward to him coming back to his country. We need young, um, constructive and critical men and women like him to come back and to rebuild his country. Um, in terms of uh, the economic uh, challenges you've talked about, one thing is to see the GDP. Another thing is that we start building financial institutions that is accepted by the international community. For the first time in 30 years, uh, our nation is at a stage where we have direct access to the international financial institution. In two years, in reality, nearly all our debt in reality can be relieved. We can have an access to investors if we put our politics and policies uh, correctly. Uh, in terms of um, the um, security, uh, I said it in my introduction, uh, to defeat terrorism doesn't only take military structures and military means. Uh, defeating terrorism means that you must have institutions that work. You must have good governance. You must have just system. You must reduce unemployment. You must keep the hopes and the aspirations of the Somali people. But remember, for the first time, every soldier in our country, after I came to office, is biometrically registered, paid directly, you know his or her duty station, and their hopes and aspirations have changed. But it will take time. Remember, uh, we are talking about a conflict of 30 years. Uh, I do understand your frustration, it is our job, uh, those of us older than you, to hand over to the young generation, uh, the nation uh, they have right for. We are trying to do as much as we can. Uh, and I have said it, the weakness and the strength that we faced uh, in the country. Uh, in terms of, of, of Sadia's question, uh, I am one of those people who believe that a country should use it is the potential of it is human capital. If 50% of our nation's population are female, uh, we should give at least 50% of the nation's share uh, to women. Otherwise, we will be like a, an engine, uh, a, a vehicle running on a half engine. Uh, in other words, if we want to compete with the rest of the world, we are in an era uh, where well, there's no difference between men and women in terms of the capacity and the expertise. 30% uh, is a start. I agree with you, and you should have the frustration that you should have. But remember, even in an advanced nations, women are still fighting for their rights. We want our strong, committed, capable Somali women to continue fighting, and they have a voice fighting alongside them. And I'm one of those people. Uh, thank you, Professor. Thank you very much.
Um, we have, uh, I'm going to take the chair's prerogative, as I said, and run a, a few minutes over. Um, I have a question from Fiona Lorton. Are you there? Fiona? Hello, can you hear me? Yep, go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, Excellency. Um, I'm from the African Union. And um, I would like to ask, there's a resolution being negotiated in the Security Council right now, which addresses the future of AMISAM. And there is a strong push by certain member states to end AMISAM at the end of December 2021 and replace it with a new mission. And I would just like to ask you, what is your view on this matter? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and uh, I also have a question from uh, Muna Ismail. Are you there? Muna? Thank you. Thank you, Laura. And thank you, His Excellency. My question is actually um, nothing to do with the elections and all that, although it relates to the wider welfare and the resource management of the country. So, um, Mr. Khaira, as an ex prime minister, what reform did you institute during your premiership to safeguard Somalia's waters from illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing practices by unlicensed fishing fleets? And I think I will keep it as short at that. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you so much, Mona. Uh, and finally, I think this will be our last question. Mohammed Ibrahim, are you there? Hello, Mohammed. Hello? Mohammed, can you, are you unmuted? Yeah. Are you, are you able to hear me now? Go ahead. Uh, thank you so much, Laura Hammond. Thank you so much, um, Chatham House and Your Excellence Hassan Khaira for this highly intriguing discussion. Um, I wanted to touch on the issue of uh, federalism. Um, you talked about political stability and is federalism the right model for Somalia or are the people applying it? Have they all misunderstood what federalism is? Because without political stability and without the right dispensation, all these reforms will go nowhere. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, Your Excellency, would you take these last few questions? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Go ahead. On the issue of uh, Amazon, um, I think we Somalis are, are very grateful uh, to the sacrifices and services, and the ultimate, pri ultimate prize, our brothers and sisters in uniform uh, have paid in our country. Without their commitment and courage, uh, and without uh, African Union's uh, commitment in this issue, uh, and the two contributing countries, we wouldn't be where we are. Uh, and it is in, in this rightful place for us uh, to show that gratitude. Um, uh, I understand that um, there is always questions on when is the transition uh, where the Somali National Army takes uh, all the responsibility of the security of the country to be completed. Um, the gains and the progress made uh, by Amazon uh, need to be sustained. And there is a critical, I would say, uh, progress that has been made in terms of reforming the Somali National Army, but more work needs to be done. And it is my view that uh, until we are capable uh, of having a, a completed uh, structure in terms of security forces, uh, we will need the support of Amazon. Uh, remember also, uh, it requires resources, both uh, economic and technical. Uh, that's why I've said these reforms that we've talked about, both economic and political, will help aid for our um, security forces to take up the responsibility of, of the country. But Mona Ismail is illegal uh, fishing in terms of our natural resources. 
I couldn't agree more. Uh, our vulnerability is one of these critical areas uh, that we are not able uh, to protect the easily and efficient. Uh, while I was in the office, we reached out to international partners, especially our partners in the European Union and others. Finally, we have at least managed to put in place in our ministry a tracking devices that alert us and for us to know uh, what is happening in our waters. Much work needs to be done, and that is why uh, both financial, uh, I would say, expertise and technical expertise uh, will be required. Uh, on Muhammad Ibrahim's uh, federalism question, uh, the question is not whether this is the right system or not. Uh, the reality is that this is the system of social contract and uh, political structure in terms of federalism that our country has agreed. Uh, I said that in my remark, the federalism came be before the nation managed to, to put in place the system's policies, procedures that would guide the federal structures itself. What we need to do now is that to make that real. And as we reform our political structures and conclude um, the revision of our constitution, we will look into the strengths and weaknesses of what is working in the system and what is not, but that must be uh, the overall Somali people who take part of that debate. Uh, the ultimate political stability uh, will depend on uh, what kind of political processes were put in place and how we make sure that each and every Somali feels that they belong in this country. They have the right access and the right opportunity so that we are all equal and we all share the same nation and work toward this prosperous and better Somali. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And I think that's a really fine note to end on. Uh, we're all hoping for a, a prosperous and peaceful Somalia going forward. Uh, particularly over these coming months where, you know, um, security and peace and hopefully a uh, smooth electoral process can be uh, completed. So thank you. Let, let me thank you so much on behalf of Chatham House and all of those who are um, gathered here uh, to thank you for your comments, your, your prepared remarks, as well as your, your willingness to take any question and, and to answer it frankly and fully. Uh, we've really appreciated the opportunity to hear from you. Uh, we wish you all the best and hope to have you back at Chatham House physically uh, before very long. Thank, Thank you, you very much to everyone for joining.